Okay, everybody. Welcome to today's meeting of Suffolk Public Sector Leaders. I'm Councillor Susie Morley, the leader of Mid Suffolk District Council, and as chair of Suffolk Public Sector Leaders, I'll be chairing the meeting today. This meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on Suffolk County Council's website whilst we are in public session. I'd like to welcome Chris Bally, the new Chief Executive of East Suffolk Council, and also Helen Pluck, the Interim uh, Chief Executive of Ipswich Borough Council. Also, as this is the last meeting before the local elections in May, when two leaders will not be standing again, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Councillor David Ellesmere and Councillor Steve Gallant for their contributions and support to SPSL. Thank you. Apologies have been received from Chris Starkey, the Chief Executive Officer of New Anglia LEP, CJ Green, the Chair of New Anglia LEP, Chief Constable Rachel Keirton, and I'd like to welcome Deputy Chief Constable Rob Jones, who is attending on her behalf. And also we've received apologies from Nicola Beach. I'd now like to hand over to Caroline to confirm any actions arising from the notes of the last meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, paper A uh, that is before you has been circulated in advance uh, of the draft notes of the meeting from the 25th of November. Uh, there's no actions arising, but as ever, obviously very happy to answer any queries. Is everybody happy to um, agree the draft notes? Lovely, thank you very much. So we've now got an update on the cost of living work supported through the Collaborative Communities Board and uh, also a funding proposal for supported food networks. And I'd like to welcome Richard Cracknell to the meeting who is here in his role as Chair of the Collaborative Communities Board. Richard's going to provide an update on the Board's cost of living related work and will introduce a new funding proposal for leaders' consideration for supported food networks. I'll hand over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. <clears throat> Hopefully I have some slides that will come up very shortly. Um, thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to taking you through the work of the CCBs, particularly around the cost of living in this winter. Um, just as a reminder for, for members, this is the CCB structure and the, the, some of the key membership organisations involved. I won't linger on this slide for too long, but just wanted you to have a, a point of reference if needed. Um, so just, I thought this slide would be helpful. It articulates the total funding available to the Collaborative Communities Board, and I'll take you through each, each section and then the details behind each. So uh, in, in, in the, the larger section, 6.1 million, allocated to hardship funds, and that's made up of 5.1 million household support fund and the 1 million previously allocated by SPSL, thank you, um, to underwrite any further costs that may arise. Uh, we also were given 650,000 from the Contain Outbreak Management Fund, which was COVID um, funding for, for this winter. And, uh, and finally, we also have uh, previously allocated SPSL funds of 900,000, and I'll ex go through those details shortly. So just to start with, um, this slide focuses on the activities funded primarily by the 5.1 million household support fund. And you'll remember back in October we launched a new online application process for members of the public to apply for a local welfare assistance scheme. Previously applicants had to go through a gateway partner and um, now members of the public can apply, apply directly to us. Uh, the new system has brought around quicker processing times, it's prevented fraud both in um, detection and, and prevention, and, and, and we've gained the ability to make direct award payments to individuals. So we have uh, sent nearly 13,000 proactive letters inviting um, previous applicants and those that we know uh, that may need support to apply. We've received just over 7,000 applications and have distributed nearly um, 850,000 pounds. The fund has also been used to fund free school meals during the school holidays at a total of 1.2 million. And we also make available food for food banks and have spent to date 150,000. And we've also allocated 500,000 to district and borough housing teams to help with associated housing costs. I'll just move on then to 
um, focus on the Contain Outbreak Management Fund, so the COVID funding uh, for this winter, with the aim of keeping communities safe, connected and well this winter. The first one was a uh, £380,000 VCSE community fund, which was allocated and distributed by our district and borough colleagues, um, awarding community groups and organisations small grants to set up warm spaces. Uh, the second one on the screen there is the prepayment household support project, 160,000. Uh, this, this project is just in the um, starting blocks getting going. This will be identifying pre-payment meter households, offering support and energy vouchers at households at a risk of immediate disconnection. Um, thirdly, we've, uh, with the help of uh, Warm Homes, how healthy people at, hosted by East Suffolk Council, set up a warm items program where members from frontline um, services can make referrals we're also link, linking with discharge teams at hospitals and uh, maternity and health visiting services so that items can be provided to keep people warm. And, and lastly, uh, a lot of work was um, completed by the Rural Coffee Caravan in their mapping of warm spaces across Suffolk and the work jointly with Community Action Suffolk um, around setting up guidance to help new groups that are opening. There was also a small amount of uh, money available for equipment if, a, if a, an organisation needed. I um, just want to cover now the um, two previous um, projects that uh, SPSL have already funded. Uh, the first being the Early Help Pilot, which is currently in East Suffolk, year two of that. Only, only have spent 50,000 of the available 400,000 uh, working with vulnerable families in Old Lacen and Sax Munden villages. Um, the CCB will be looking over the next few months at the evaluation and outcomes of the pilot with a view to rolling out similar support across the county. The second one here is the vulnerable persons data set, uh, 500,000, and members will be aware of the delays around data, re data requirements from various partners that uh, make up the vulnerable per persons data set has delayed starting. But I'm pleased to say that it is in the, in the final stages of being, uh, being agreed, and I look forward to providing an update next time. So I just want to move on now to my final part, which is the ask for a new allocation of 1.5 million to fund a supported food network over three years. I just wanted to spend a moment speaking about why. Why, why now? Well, um, CCB partners felt now was the right time because we are seeing an increase in use in our food banks. We have seen uh, the doubling of children receiving free school meals and we also know that local citizens advice activity has also doubled. We also do know that there is limited county-wide coordination that brings together all of our food activities into in one, to one, one coherent plan. And we have a number of food outlets across, across Suffolk which are doing a fantastic job meeting the needs of local people. And they all operate in slightly different ways. So I just want to introduce now the, the concept of a supported food network. It would be a county-wide strategy, thinking globally but acting locally. Uh, and it would enhance our current support offers through LWAS, the Household Support Fund, UK Shared Prosperity Fund and also the Holiday Activity and Food Programme. We'd like to work with the new and existing uh, food outlets to develop a Suffolk framework, a blueprint, if you like, for how we would, we would see the food network working. Providing a blend of offers from crisis to mainstream um, support, developing the skills offered at food banks so that they can either signpost or provide wraparound support for things like benefits to skills and employment support. Um, it would also mean that we'd have some clear reporting and we could evidence our outcomes and the, 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 um, the supportive food network would, would make provision for food items so that those outlets are well stocked and, and can be trusted by the community. Um, the second part of the supported food network would be around focusing on sustainability. We would look for corporate sponsorships, um, public giving, and we would work with partners to, to work that up so that there would be a legacy left after this investment. And the third, the third focus of the supported food network would be the movement of food from A to B. So we know that food is made available sometimes at short notice and it is um, tricky to move it to where it needs to get to. So we would like to work with and, and develop a, a, a bank of volunteers to be able to do that. Um, this slide here is just a way of visualising um, the supported food network, um, working with um, households and families moving from low food security and their, their needs to rely on food banks, pop-ups and pantries through to higher food security households, um, able to access mainstream supermarkets via uh, 
a number of stepping stones of support. This is my final slide, and just, just to um, outline how the money will be used, we would like to employ a total of five officers hosted by one organisation, um, but they would be embedded within local district and borough teams so that local needs are understood and met, but there is county-wide coordination. So that would be year one and two. We would then take a review, and it is proposed that the, the staff requirement would reduce significantly in year three, with the remainder of the funds being used to support um, the network's development, food supply, training and communications. So I think that's the last slide, and, and it totals 1.5 million over the three years. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, Tim, you're first. Um, thanks, Susie. Yeah, no, very interesting. I'm more than happy to support this, but I do have just a couple of questions for clarification. Um, how many children do you know, roughly, uh, do we have on free school meals? So, and how will the how will they be able to access this support? I know you've got various staff in there, but how is the mechanism actually going to work? Because I think that's that's really important. Um, I'm also very, very pleased to see the help for the rural coffee caravan because it's very often um, rural communities don't register uh, as they should do, so that's a good point. And um, the other point I wanted to ask, if I may, Richard, is I think we've spoken before about, uh, call it education, if you like, about how to make meals more um, cheaply, more cost effectively. There are all sorts of things involved in that. And those people who are very sadly in this position, helping them to become, I suppose, more self-sufficient. And I don't mean that to be patronising. I really want to emphasise that. So if you've got any details on that, that would be uh, very interesting, please. Thank you. I wish I'd bought my laptop now and I could give you the, um, the live number of uh, children receiving free school meals. But I can say that that data is available publicly on the cost of living dashboard on the Healthy Suffolk website. The way that... Um, money is distributed to families with free school meal children is via the schools so vouchers are made available in schools and um, distribute those and that is how we would um, like to work with those families moving forward through our outreach uh, through the food network um, i didn't mention but you're quite right to point out that the provisions that i've outlined are, are one aspect of the wider food network and we would look to provide menu plans and growing packs and other, and, other, and other linked resources to enable that complete wraparound support. So thank you for bringing those up. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Richard. And John. Um, thanks, Susie. Um, as usual, Tim has shot my fox, but um, never, nevertheless, I mean, first of all, Richard, thank you very much for a very good presentation and, and a very interesting one, and actually makes you pleased about the various things that SPSL and others are doing on that front. On, I'm also supportive of the food network proposal but just wanted to check on a couple of things. My understanding is that improved coordination of the various efforts going on will both improve delivery and actually probably save food being wasted in the process. Is that correct? Yes. And also I'm delighted to see you're working with the um, various teams in the district, which is great. So supportive, but just that was my quick comment. I think you addressed it a bit, but. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, not, I didn't mention all of the details, but we know that there is a, a lot of work around food waste and reducing food waste, and that is, that is planned to be programmed into that wider support and actions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Steve? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Susie, and, and, and thank you, Richard. I, I, I suppose, um, uh, for me, this is, this is really important, something that we're working really hard in the East around our um, Easter Squeeze uh, campaign, and I'm um, really pleased to see that this links into that and isn't another system but is is an enhancement to to what's uh, ever there which is really key but i think um you know tim tim raised a, a really important bit about the rural areas of our county which are you know the most difficult to reach the most difficult to to provide that support in and the support you do um, provide costs a lot more than it does in a, in our urban centers you know uh, simply um around the transport so we're 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 really keen to be exploring a, a mobile food bank. Um, you know, that's, that's something I think we, we need to really seriously look at. If you, if you think back to all those years, and, you know, John will remember, he's very old, but, you know, when, when, when you had a village shop, that, and a mobile shop that, that yeah. went around the villages, you know, what we need is, is that concept. Um, but, uh, but, yes, uh, but, but, you know, we won't do horse and cart, as you'll remember, John, but... Um, 
but what we what we can do is that you know we we can look at a way of, of reaching out to those communities because the expectation is that you know if we just have these central hubs and we're we're requiring people to come to those that's that's a huge cost um and a huge difficulty in in transportation in the rural communities so i'd really like that you, you know if we could, if we can sort of think of a way that we can take that out to the rural communities uh, i think there's coll collaboration opportunities to achieve that thank you thank you steve david thank you yeah, there was. Um, I mean, there's been several different waves of support for food. So the, there's a, the, the historic food banks, um, which have been with us for a long time. And then there was a big community impetus at the start of COVID, um, where support was provided. Then and since the cost of living, there's been. I think there's been another wave of of, of support uh, too. And so I think it is important that we do try to. Um, to tie this together because many of them are at different levels of, of operation. Uh, some are purely at providing food where others have moved on and looking at what other support they can give, what help they can give on budgeting and so on to, to help people um, uh, out of that situation. So, so I think it is important that we do that, that we, you know, we, if, if we can help some of the some of the groups to develop, we do that. If there are areas where they're not operating, we can provide help as well. Um, but my one just not note of caution is, you know, there's a lot of energy behind some of these community groups, um, and they've put a lot of effort into developing what they do, working together. Uh, and my concern would be that we don't bureaucratize the process in doing this and impose a model on them that they feel uncomfortable with uh, and may actually put them off from working with us. So uh, it, it was just pleading that whatever we do, we do with the organisations that are working, we do it with a light touch and work to bring them on rather than trying to impose anything on them. Thank you, David. John? Uh, yeah, uh, similar to uh, what David's just said about that a large number of individual community groups have, have grown up, um, particularly in response to COVID and also now with the cost of living crisis. Um, so I think that what we're proposing here is, is going to provide that um, essential coordinating and support role across the county and, and to be able to, to do that on a countywide basis I think is going to bring out the best in, in those groups um, and allow them all um, through working together and, and through us to um, uh, to provide a, a, wow. an even improved service uh, over and above what they've been able to achieve so far, which has been excellent. Um, particularly, so many have responded so quickly to, to the crisis. But um, but providing things like the making sure the right foods in the right place, um, the support for um, helping with um, money advice, that kind of thing, all those are, are essential components, which I think can can best be done at a county wide level. And and it, it shows, um, I think, uh, it demonstrates exactly what, what we're about, um, working together as a county, um, doing more together than we can individually. Thank you, John. We, we know rising costs are seriously squeezing household budgets, and the network of food banks, community larders, and other charities are doing an outstanding job of helping people. That locally de delivered support remains absolutely vital. And this project would work closely with those existing providers, also offering them additional support. And this, this results in, in real, impactful real impactful collaboration, enhancing what is already there, and also it looks at ways of getting support to people much earlier. As Richard said, there's already a cost of living dashboard on the system, and we'll include the link to that in the minutes. So, from everybody's words, I can, I can tell, I hope, that you're all really supportive of this. So, um, I, I just confirm for me that you are happy to support this 1.5 million over three years? Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Richard. Lovely. Thank you for your support. Moving on now to the housing board proposals. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Councillor Becky Hopfensperger, who is here in her role as Chair of the Housing Portfolio Holders Group, and she's going to introduce the Housing Board update and funding proposals. Um, I'd also like to, to um, 
introduce the officers supporting this item. And we have with us today um, Heather Tucker, Davina Howes, Tina Hines, Jonathan Miller-Williams and Laura Burns as supporting Becky. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'll hand over to Councillor Hopsensberger now to introduce this update. And we'll pause for questions at that point before moving on to the presentation of the funding proposals. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Susie, and thank you for inviting um, me here today. It's a real pleasure to be representing the recently formed um, Suffolk Housing Portfolio Holders Board. And as, as Susie said, um, I have the pleasure of being the chair of that board. Um, in a moment, I'll be handing over to Arthur to take you through a few slides, but I want to start by explaining the papers you have before you today. Um, we're conscious that the Housing Board has not provided you with an update for a while, and, and certainly not since the um, Suffolk Portfolio Holders Board has been formed. So we didn't, we didn't want to um, simply pitch up and ask you for £170,000 without some background. So you have before you today um, paper C1, which is the overarching background report. Um, you also have a slide deck, which Arthur's going to lead us through, which summarizes um, paper C1. And finally, but most importantly, you have um, two funding requests, which is papers C2 and C3, which I'll return to at the end of the slides. So I'm now going to hand you over to Arthur, who's gonna take you through a brief history of the board and make you aware of its terms of reference, strategic goals, and highlight four case studies um, of its recent successes. So over to you, Arthur. Thank you, and got the slides. Brilliant, fantastic. So uh, as you've heard, um, paper C1 gives you all of this detail, but we wanted to just bring it to life a bit more uh, rather than just asking you to, to read through it. So I'm gonna take you through the, the slightly more boring bits, the governance and the history, uh, and then colleagues sat behind all of you uh, so uh, Heather, Laura and uh, Jonathan will take you through the case studies and then we'll come on to the, the financial ask itself. So as you can see from the slides, the, the blue boxes just give you a bit of the history of the board itself. Your housing officers across the whole of Suffolk have been meeting for, for time immemorial, coming together, uh, discussing issues in relation to housing. But that's had, in more recent times, a bit more structure added to it and it's been broadened because clearly housing has a significant bearing on everything. Uh, that we do as a public sector. It doesn't exist in its own little bubble. So that group was expanded to include health and had formal uh, terms of reference uh, added to it. During the COVID crisis, uh, a specific task and finish group was created, linked into the Collaborative Communities Board, so Richard, that you were just hearing from, uh, specifically focusing on the housing and the homelessness aspects, and we'll come back to that in a moment. And then most recently, as part of the wider Suffolk Public Sector Leaders architecture, the systems, if you like, uh, we've put in place from the back end of last summer the formal portfolio holders board, which you've heard uh, Becky Hoffersberg as chairs uh, on behalf of, uh, of Suffolk as a whole. And that has formal mission, uh, vision, and terms of reference, which I'll run through briefly. Uh, and the bits in orange boxes are the case studies we're going to cover. Uh, and neatly hidden on the slides in front of you, behind all of yourselves, is the financial ask, which is the other orange box, which we'll come on to at the end. So in terms of terms of reference, I think the key bit just to emphasize here is that the obvious gubbins in terms of linking into this group, uh, the portfolio holder group and the officer support that sits behind that fundamentally links into SPSL, that's the whole point, and works alongside the other parts of the system, whether that's the growth board, whether that's the collaborative communities board or the environment board and so on and so forth. So that's really what the terms of reference is saying. But the critical bit that you've got there in the middle is support and promote the work of Cross Suffolk to address the well-being of residents through housing improvements. That's the reason the board exists. That's what we're trying to achieve through taking this approach. And that's been codified, if you like, in a bit more substance in terms of making sure that we've got a vision, uh, a mission, and strategic goals. And I'm not going to read through the vision and mission because I'm sure uh, council of colleagues will have done that already. But I'll just draw out a couple of elements from the strategic goals. Uh, so what we're trying to achieve there is a focus on housing stock in all of its shapes and forms, and particularly affordable, but also specialist housing stock needs uh, across the whole of Suffolk. A focus on housing support, so not just the stock, but the support that needs to run side, alongside that uh, from people supporting our tenants, our, our residents. And then a particular focus, and it's part of the ask today, or one of the asks today, around homelessness and rough sleeping and wanting to end, specifically end homelessness and rough sleeping in Suffolk by 2027. 
and sat behind that, supporting all of the systems, and it's not unique to the Housing Board, the importance of shared data, uh, the importance of shared systems and sustainable funding. So that's just a whistle stop uh, in terms of the, the governance elements that sits behind uh, the ask and hopefully gives you assurance in terms of how this is going to be continued to deliver forward. But I will hand over now, I think I'm handing on to Laura first, uh, just to talk you through the case study in terms of the independent living service. Hi, thank you. Um, so the independent living Suffolk service support people who own their own homes or have permission from their landlords to make adaptations to their property to enable customers to live safely, comfortably and independently in their own homes for as long as possible. The service give information and advice around all aspects of housing choices, adaptations and painful works to ensure that customers are informed as to all the options available to them. There was a county-wide contract with Orbit which was managed by Suffolk County Council that was bought in house in December 2020 and within six months from the decision date to terminate the service was set up which is a testament to everyone's willingness to work together. The independent living service have a team of occupational therapists who carry out occupational therapy assessments and liaise with the district and borough councils who handle the grants and oversee the work and adaptations that are completed. In the first full year, <clears throat> 2021 to 22, £3.8 million was granted, which is 25% more than when under orbit. 701 occupational therapy referrals were completed. 2,790 grab rails were fitted. 568 disabled facilities grants and minor adaptation grants were granted. And strength, weaknesses, opportunity and threat informed action plans were developed identifying strategic priorities, risks and opportunities. So I just wanted to read through a case study here, which highlights some of the, the great work that goes on within the Independent Living Suffolk Service that shows how the service meets the customers' needs and supports them to keep safe and independent in their own homes. So this one's from West Suffolk. RM had an extensive period of time in hospital following acute onset of a new health condition, resulting in partial paralysis. He was fit and well prior to this. He was referred to the Rehabilitation Centre for an assessment for home adaptations to facilitate discharge from hospital. The Independent Living Service worked closely with the Rehab Centre to arrange joint visits, share information assessments and determine what adaptations were essential for discharge and what was required longer term. These plans were discussed with West Suffolk District Council to ensure grant eligibility and split the grant to facilitate adaptations in two phases. RM's home was appropriately prepared for discharge with care taken not to be overwhelming as RM had been home, hadn't been home for nearly 18 months. Adaptations provided were a stair lift and alterations to the ground, toilet, ground floor toilet to maximise space and install a bio bidet. A wet room was considered but RM was progressing well with rehab. This was no longer required but having the option made returning home easier for him. The adaptations provided have met long term needs in addition to providing safety for ongoing rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. So in 2020, to minimise the risk of some of the most vulnerable and marginalised adults in the county from contracting coronavirus, um, the government made the unprecedented announcement that all councils needed to offer accommodation to anyone who was rough sleeping, and we had less than 24 hours to make that happen, which I think is fair to say was no mean feat. Suffolk authorities worked incredibly well together, and although working relationships were already good, a positive from the pandemic is the legacy of how much stronger the working relationships have become. At the height of the pandemic, we were meeting daily on teams with not only local authority housing colleagues, but with the police, health, probation service and commissioners from public health. Anyone with experience of working in homelessness knew that finding the accommodation to place rough sleepers in was the easy bit. It was ensuring sufficient support was in place to enable them to remain in that accommodation that was going to be the challenge. Some of the examples of the tailored support put in place included, ar included arranging for drug and alcohol treatment services to visit the accommodation where rough sleepers were placed. 
health screening, vaccination programmes for hepatitis, sexual health services, and then when the COVID vaccine rollout commenced, outreach clinics took place at all homelessness accommodation sites across Suffolk. After initially accommodating 42 individuals in the first day, within six weeks that number had risen to 160. For years and years there had been talk of hidden homelessness, also commonly referred to as sofa surfing. And when the country went into its unprecedented lockdown, people who managed to move between various houses suddenly found themselves with nowhere to go, hence the large number of single people requiring accommodation. Um, if I have the next slide, please, Arthur. Thank you. So to give you a, a brief overview of a, a case study from somebody that we assisted through um, everyone in, um, so often rough sleeping is reported in statistical forms, so we felt it would be really beneficial to actually give you a real-life example of what everyone in enabled us to achieve. So this is an example of a single man. He was found to be rough sleeping. He had a range of complex health needs, including mobility issues, chronic asthma, um, as well as depression and anxiety. He had a long history of drug misuse and was still using illicit drugs. He was someone who frequently had experienced periods of rough sleeping because when accommodation was found, he would inevitably end up being evicted and so returning to the streets again. As part of the everyone in response, he was offered bed and breakfast accommodation initially in June 2020 and referred to Suffolk Mind Waves and the Night Owl services for support. He was able to maintain this placement successfully and in October 2020, he was moved into more suitable temporary accommodation. Once in his temporary accommodation placement, he started to engage well with drug and alcohol recovery outreach services and in February 2021, he was actually rehoused into his own general needs tenancy. This is just one of many examples of the successful outcomes we have had as part of the Everyone In, Initi Everyone in Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and, and members will know part of the ask is about how we then build on that initiative that was linked to COVID, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But if I hand over to Jonathan to talk about housing-related support. So, housing related support is a preventative service that provides support to people aged 18 and above who are struggling to live independently. This is delivered in the form of a combined housing and support opportunity for individuals. It provides a stable environment as well as directly supporting individuals to develop key independent living skills. In doing so, it provides a key bridge to independence for people leaving care or with chaotic lifestyles and, and is delivered within a two year period. It also provides a platform for them to access support offers from multiple agencies to build a sustainable support network. Following this two-year period, individuals are expected to move on into independent tenancies, employment and overall successful lives. Delivering this service successfully represents an opportunity to propel individuals away from statutory care and support needs, both in the short term and for their lifetime. As the County Council, without housing responsibilities, it can be challenging to deliver housing-based interventions that mitigate or prevent care and support needs. However, the Council recognises the value in creating this supportive environment to prevent long-term care demand, and therefore commissions this service through a number of contracted providers. This service is funded by the Council as a preventative measure for potential future demand on other more costly services it would be obliged to provide. However, it cannot be delivered in isolation from both the housing implications and opportunities. Whilst the service must demonstrate value to the County Council, the opportunity, opportunity to both enhance the impact of the service and deliver a wider systemic and social impact can only be, be achieved by working in partnership with the Council's partners at Suffolk Housing Board. So in 2019, the Council embarked on a recommissioning project for these services involving a complete overhaul uh, of how the council placed individuals into services uh, and retendering of contracts with providers. And you can see some of the detail on that in the slides. This presented uh, a significant opportunity to work with Suffolk Housing Board partners to remove duplication of housing offers and develop a more effective interface between housing and care needs. In 2022, the council completed a joint award process for these contracts involving a joint panel, including officer representation from adult and children's services in the County Council, as well as district and borough partners. This ex exercise has been successful and it has allowed the council to develop long-standing services 
into, more fo into a more focused offer that better responds to the financial and strategic priorities of the Council at the same time as providing house housing opportunities in better alignment uh, and with a clearer purpose for district and boroughs. Suffolk Housing Board provided an open space to develop trusting relationships between partners to achieve this aim. And I think we've got a slide next with a, a case study that I think provides uh, a really important example of the kind of outcomes we can achieve when we think about the priorities we all have and how those can slot together to achieve fantastic outcomes for individuals. Brilliant. Thank you, Jonathan. And then just before we go on to the, uh, the funding ask itself, I uh, just wanted to highlight and flag particularly some news come in this week in terms of external funding that we've been able to draw into Suffolk to support with the wider housing piece. So, Heather, can you just outline that for us? Certainly. Thank you, Arthur. So, yeah, Suffolk local authorities have actually been successful in securing funding through two different schemes in the last couple of months. So, in December, um, the joint bid was put together um, through the Suffolk Housing Board, which East Suffolk has hosting, um, in relation to Local Government Association Housing Advisors Programme. And we were successful in obtaining £20,000. So this funding will support us um, to commission a county-wide housing strategy review, which will be aimed at increasing the number of genuinely affordable properties available to meet those um, in housing need. This is likely to include improved schemes for returning long-term empty homes back into use or enhanced schemes to enable more access to the private rented sector. And I think the aim really behind it is we identified how many properties are available to rent, how many are available to buy, and actually how many people we have on the housing register, and what can we um, collectively do to try and bridge some of that gap um, that we see at the moment. Um, and the second funding we have received is a really exciting project, and it actually was only publicly announced yesterday. But in June last year, um, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities published a white paper called A Fairer Private Rented Sector. And this document is aligned to the Renters' Reform Bill. It sets out the government's aspirations that everyone should have access to a decent home and that no one should be condemned to living properties that are inadequately heated, unsafe or unhealthy. It is believed there are more than 2.8 million people in the country paying to live in, live in homes that are damp, dangerous, cold and that they are powerless to put things right, especially with the threat of sudden eviction hanging over them. The government has committed to tackling these injustices by offering a new deal to those living in the private rented sector, one with quality, affordability and fairness at its heart. The white paper, A Fairer Private Rented Sector, sets out how the government intends to deliver on this mission, raising the bar on quality and making this new deal a reality for renters everywhere. £14 million has been committed across the country to support um, trailblazer projects to um, support the implementation of the Renters' Reform Bill. Suffolk, by working together, has been successful in achieving 2.2 million of that 14 million across the country, which is a significant achievement. This money will enable us to continue to work collaboratively across all the districts and boroughs in Suffolk to tackle poor quality private rented sector properties. It will enable us to raise the profile of successful enforcement and change expectations and drive forward improvement. It will enable us to consider what is needed to bring private rented sector properties up to the proposed decent home standard and how landlords respond to enforcement. And it will enable us to develop an evidence base of effective approaches to enforcement and then share that best practice across the country. It also enables us to test the extent to which more rigorous enforcement can become self-funding through licensing, incomes and fines. Um, and uh, yeah, just to say again, you know, this is a really, really exciting project for Suffolk to be a part of um, and a huge thanks to all the officers involved because it's been a, a huge piece of work to do in a very short space of time and it wouldn't have been possible without um, all the districts and boroughs working so collaboratively together. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and I suspect Suffolk Public Sector leaders might want us to come back in due course to report about progress in relation to particularly that, that latter funding. So that then leaves us, or leads us on rather, to the, the specific ask for today, and I will hand back to Councillor Hofsenberger to take you through that. 
Thank you, Arthur. And um, I think it feels as if we've come a bit en masse to um, today's meeting. Um, but I, I think it really indicates that this is really a Suffolk-wide collaboration project and our commitment to working together to um, look at this um, particular cause. And you can tell by how successful that collaboration is by those two amounts that we have actually managed to secure um, through central government. And we really do want to build on that momentum um, of everyone in and those, that great work that was done um, and just shows what we can do if we work together across Suffolk um, quickly um, to um, solve, this, solve this issue. So um, Suffolk Public Sector Leaders has briefly set aside one million for housing and today we're here to do our first drawdown request for some of that funding. You have two reports um, that set out the funding request before you. Um, as I mentioned previously, it's on C2 and C3. Um, Chair, I don't know if you want to take these two separately or together and then ask questions. I think we just have a quick pause for questions. John, you want um, to go first? Well, by all means, I mean, I've, I've just, I'm sort of rather preempting my question, but first of all, thank you very much for all the presentations. I think it's been excellent. And, and I think it's true to say even youngsters like um, Steve will remember <laughs> that support across Suffolk has got better and more available across the board. And I think in West Suffolk, we we're, were particularly pleased. I think we had got it down to nine rough sleepers in December. I think it's now zero rough sleepers. So I think working with um, the county and across the board has been extremely successful. Um, obviously, great news about any external funding we can get to help the efforts. My question, actually, on the first of the two requests, which I'm broadly supportive of, obviously, is it's, it's, it says it's, it's 75,000 commission of external support to help identify best practice and potential solutions. I'm just wondering, given how well everybody seems to be doing, why we need external support to tell us how well we're doing or what we're not doing well enough or where we think that could be improving. So it's not being anti it, I'd just like some clarification on why we need external support when we seem to have such an excellent on mass presentation of people who are doing things. And I couldn't possibly give them any external support, even if they paid me 75,000. There we go. I'm happy to, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer that question. So I think there's probably two main reasons. Uh, the first is about having sufficient capacity within the system to be able to focus on this sufficiently. Um, but I think the other aspect is, and this isn't a criticism of, and thank you for the, for the comments about the, the level of uh, intellect and support that already exists within the system, but it's a recognition that these challenges aren't unique to Suffolk. Uh, in fact, they're not unique even to the UK. Uh, and so the importance of looking elsewhere is to try and learn best practice from outside of our own area, draw in that best practice from elsewhere in the country, and then bring that to Suffolk and deliver accordingly. So that's why we've looked to the external support uh, to do that, rather than trying to deliver it purely from within our own resources, because we know our area, but we don't necessarily know all of the social challenges and, and the solutions that exist elsewhere. John, did you want to come back? Uh, just uh, thank you for that, and I, I understood totally. And, and um, as I say, this was meant positively rather than negatively, the question. But, and I take the point that we should learn from other places. Are we not doing that already? Is that not available without paying somebody or something 75,000 to do something that is possibly available? Because presumably, we'd be happy to share our best practice with other areas if they asked. I don't know if we charge them 75,000. So I'm not being finickety about this, but I'm just saying all the money seems to be very well spent, absolutely supportive. It's just a small question about the detail. Yeah, and I think the, the main answer to that is the first point, which is, no, we don't sufficient, sufficiently have the capacity within our existing resources to do that, nor necessarily the, the specific skills. Um, and I suppose just to make the point, it's up to 75,000. It may well end up being significantly less. What we're asking for is access to up to that amount of money. Once we've commissioned it, it may well, may well come in at under that level. Uh, but clearly we don't know that yet until we've had, had approval here. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and thanks for the presentations. Uh, really, really enlightening. I, I, I think what's, uh, what's, what's key for me and, and to, uh, to uh, pick up on the point that John made is, is around capacity within the system and, and what we need is to make sure that we have capacity to match our ambition and I think that, that you know, looking at the, uh, the papers that are prepared for us now, that I think that's really important. Um, and I think, you know, uh, 
dare I say, if I was to, if I was to be critical of the system, we're really good at the reacting, but we've got to get upstream of this. We've got to get upstream of the issue because we all know, as, as district and borough councillors, um, you know that, that we've got a. A housing waiting list that's probably not the right term but uh, Heather will tell me what it is but we, we, we've got this list of people that are that, that, that need housing need help need to move on you know the accommodation they've got isn't super and if we can't get upstream of stopping people having becoming homeless in the first place then we're never gonna feed that beast we're never gonna satisfy it so um, I, you know I would I'm, I'm very supportive uh, of the two papers and the two asks that, that are here before us today, um, and I hope that they will, uh, the opportunity will be used to look at elsewhere in the country and indeed the world. Uh, though I don't want a whole load of foreign travel, um, but uh, <laughs> you know, to look to look at, at what is going on elsewhere to get upstream of the problem, so that we can prevent homelessness rather than trying to put a sticking plaster on it afterwards. Thank you, and thank you, Steve. You're absolutely right. And um, what's really important for us is that we don't just um, deal with these issues at crisis point, and we do do that preventative work and support people before they get to that crisis crisis point. And actually, the hundred thousand pounds is really important to look at that. It's how we prepare people to live independent lives, um, rather than just effectively just um, chucking them out, so to speak. Want a better word? Um, um, and let them deal with things, things like um, not knowing how to read meters. Um, people need those life skills, not knowing how to financially manage um, your, your um, issues um, properly. Um, we want to really make sure people are totally prepared and have had that support to live independent lives and be able to maintain those tendencies and live independently for as long as possible. Can I just come back on that? Uh, uh, so, thanks, and, and, and you're absolutely right. And, you know, the, the example of reading meters is, is, is really useful. If you happen to have anyone that can help me um, control, my, control my central heating system at home, I'd be really grateful because it's way beyond my technical ability. Thank you. Tim, you're next. Yeah. Um, thanks, Susie. Uh, I'm completely supportive of this, and of course these are a couple of first steps out of the £1 million fund we've got, which I've, perhaps um, people need to remember in case anybody is listening to this on live discussion. So I'm certainly very supportive of it. Uh, one or two questions I just have, and this is perhaps for developing further on as this um, very welcome initiative uh, continues. Um, first of all, I was very pleased to see working with the police probation so on, because that is a real issue, rehabilitation of offenders, and I think I've mentioned this before, these ghastly houses of multiple occupancy, putting prisoners back into the communities where they sometimes came from, which they would rather not do, in order to make sure they can uh, be on the straight and narrow. That's perhaps something to look at in future. But coming back to the rough sleeping, I just wanted to know how well are we coordinating with the voluntary and charitable sector? For example, we gave a grant from our Crime Disorder and Reduction Fund to Selig, which is um, housed just up the road here in Ipswich, to help those who are homeless so they don't get exploited and vulnerable to criminal, uh, criminal activity. And then going further on from this, um, one of the other concerns I'm sure we all share are these, um, and it's related to houses of multiple occupancy, but where people are exploited into forced labour, Ill illegal immigration, domestic servitude and so on. Will that be part of the programme going forward? Because you do sort of reference this in some of the um, papers here, and I just wondered if you could comment on that, whether that would be something in future that would be taken on board. Thank you. Heather? Thank you. I mean, across Suffolk, um, I think it's fair to say all local authorities work very closely with the different charities. There's some that are Suffolk-wide, so all local authorities will work with, and then there's others that are more just located in one um, sort of area, so like Selig, for example, just being Ipswich. In relation to, um, you know, people that have taken advantage of, like, modern slavery, there is um, been a recent case law um, update to the Homelessness Code of Guidance around the right support and assistance that can be given. So they are very much given assistance. There's a particular um, sort of legal point now that enables us to do that more freely than we did before.
Steve, did you want to contribute? Yeah, I, I, I just just wanted to say, um, uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Tim didn't mean this, but there, but there are many homes of multiple occupancy that are exceptionally well run and mm -hmm. are exceptionally great places uh, for people to live in, and they fulfil a really important part of the of the of the housing portfolio. Um, of, yes, uh, uh, so I just didn't want. I'm sure Tim didn't mean this thing to say that all of them are like that, but uh, there are some really excellent ones. But I do acknowledge that there are some that are less so. No, I think, uh, yes, let me clarify that. I absolutely agree, Steve, but there are, unfortunately, some examples where it does cause problems, but I would not wish anybody to think that it was a sweeping generalisation that all of them are in the naughty corner, because <coughs> they certainly are, but it is, there are some places where it can be a particular difficulty and problem, and then we get extra police demand accordingly, um, so that's something we need to focus on to try and eliminate it as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you for that clarification, Tim. Uh, Matthew, you're next. Thanks, Susie. Um, well, I think this, like the previous paper, is another really good example of actually what we do well, working across the entire Suffolk system, uh, using the f funding of SPSL to benefit that. Um, so I'm totally supportive of the 175,000 that's being asked for on the drawdown. Um, and I think, for me, what I really like seeing is, in the papers, you know, the constant realisation that we don't know it all, and actually co-production with young people is actually so critical rather than us telling them actually them being involved at the table from day one so i really welcome this thank you for bringing it becky and i think it's a great piece of work thank you matthew uh, john you're next yeah I'm, I'm fully supportive of both of these um uh, we had a, a lot of good government uh, uh, financial support through COVID to tackle rough sleeping, and we all did um, very well with, with that. But we need to keep up the momentum. And uh, I see that drawing down 75,000 pounds from the million we've allocated to the housing board makes a lot of sense to get this um, external support so we can keep up that momentum. And I'm particularly supportive of the 100,000 for uh, drawdown for the uh, young, young people independence training, because uh, quite clearly, um, if you're a young care leaver in your late teens, um, uh, you do, you are going to need a, an awful lot of support. Even even us, I mean, when we were that age, uh, I, I can't imagine any of us would have been that, that capable of independent living. So um, uh, I'm very supportive of both of these. Thank you, John. Um, Becky, did you want to carry on with the, some more slides? No, no, that, that's all of it, that thank was, you. That's it. it, okay. So, anybody else want to contribute? No? Excellent, thank you all. So, are leaders happy to support the supported living training funding of 100K? Yeah. And are you happy to support the proposal of 75K for research capacity? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Becky and officers. It's a pleasure to see you all, as always. Um, so moving on now to the budget, um, and I'd like to invite Ian Gallin to present an overview of the budget paper, which has been circulated in advance. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so this is your uh, usual paper. You've got the, uh, the budget. It reports that you've currently still got uh, 2.477 million uh, in your business rates pot. That obviously gets uh, subject to uh, uh, agreement about our pooling arrangements. That has the potential of being topped up. Uh, next financial year. So obviously we will now update that following your uh, the decisions you've just made in terms of in terms of spend. Uh, the report then goes on to give you your uh, the light touch uh, update around those key uh, SPSL <coughs> investments. Uh, so that's your usual report. But uh, I can chair if I just give uh, uh, name check this document that I think uh, thank you to members who have all commented on it. This uh, I think fulfils. Uh, the ask that you uh, collectively made of uh, a publicly shareable summary highlights document by necessity, of course it is, uh, it is a summary. Thank you for the comments to date uh, and to Brad and Caroline for uh, pulling that together. I think uh, there's just a couple bit of issues that I think we just need to tidy up, Tim. Uh, one just around the clarification of uh, the policing arrests relate to uh, county lines rather than uh, generally, so we'll pick that up and that document will be made publicly available um, probably the early part of next week uh, and for leaders to share uh, moving forward. So nothing else to add, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Anybody have any questions, comments? Steve? Um, I, 
thank you particularly for that document, um, Ian, and, and whoever was uh, was involved in its production, because I think, you know, it's very easy for us to sit here and just go, oh, yeah, we'll do that, we'll do that. But actually, you know, when you, when you see it all written down in a piece of paper and you realise, uh, as Matthew um, just alluded to, how much we can achieve if we come together and work as a system um, with what is relatively, I know that it's big numbers, but it's not, it's not massive numbers if you, if you look at the scale of things that, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm incredibly proud of that, of the, the contents of that document, and I think we all as Suffolk public sector leaders should be, um, because I think we have come together and have delivered some fantastic projects and initiatives, um, which are a huge benefit to, to the whole of, uh, of Suffolk and indeed the, the, the wider regions. So. Uh, just, just my thanks for the production of that document. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Tim? Yeah, thanks. I absolutely endorse um, what Steve has just said. It does show, if you like, that power of collaboration can make a big difference. One thing, if I may, Ian, just it, not, not for now, but I think it might be helpful. We have quite a few things in the budget there that have been earmarked. Just an occasional update as to how matters are progressing would be helpful. I quite appreciate, for example, at Hawley Junction, that's down to, well, the various names for network rail or not work rail or whatever we like to call it or anyway. But some of the others, is there, are matters being progressed? I know we've earmarked it and that's really important, so I'm not in any way being critical of that, but it would be occasionally, uh, it might be useful to have an update on what's being progressed because there are, I think, I don't know, four or five, half a dozen projects there, just so we can keep tabs on it if, if that's okay. Yeah. But thanks very much for the report, always very helpful. David? Yes, thanks. Um, I, the, the document, I think, really useful, just highlighting uh, some of the things that we've that we funded and the successes of it. And, you know, I reflect, you, you said at the start that this is going to be my last meeting, uh, and I reflect back on some of the things that we've done. Um, certainly, the pool business rates that we've had available to us, I think, have enabled us to do things in my time as leader. Uh, that we wouldn't necessarily have been able to do. Uh, and I think back to some of the things where we were particularly bold, so dealing with uh, with gangs and county lines, uh, Tim, where we, we as as leaders said that actually we need to put significantly more money into that, and I think we've, we've made a real uh, difference on that. One of the other ones I was particularly proud of was when we put funding into schools in deprived areas where um, we... we basically um, showed confidence in the head teachers of those schools to come up with the uh, the schemes that they knew would help their, their pupils local to their area rather than what they were used to, which is having national-wide schemes impose, imposed on them, and there were some big successes there. Uh, and, and looking at, at more recently in the document, uh, the, um, you know, the historic funding and the continued funding that we're putting into Screen Suffolk, which is paying real dividends and getting uh, getting our county on TV screens and on film, which is going to be fantastic for tourism. I'm not convinced we would ever have been able to do that um, uh, if we hadn't had the pool business rates. Uh, and then locally, the, uh, the Suffolk Inclusive Growth Investment Fund, where we've worked together with a local enterprise partnership, and we've managed to uh, get investment for St Stephen's Church to turn that into a new music venue, which would be fantastic for the for the nightlife of Ipswich. So some really good projects there, and um, I you know I hope that continues uh, when when I'm no longer here. Uh, but just on uh, along those lines, we've um, in in the budget report we we've, we've made and we've done this today. We've made, we've agreed some funding where it stretches over multiple years. Uh, and I think what would be really useful, certainly for my successor and Steve's successor as well, and if there's any others, um, is if we could have a spreadsheet of, of the, the future years and what we've, what we've agreed to spend in those years, just so that the people who come after us who don't necessarily know all the history of this are fully aware of, of the, the detail of the funding and what we've agreed. Um, I think that will be that will be really useful. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Want to? Ian? Yeah, thank you. We'll pick up both Tim uh, and uh, David's uh, <coughs> David's suggestions for that. I mean, just just to, I mean, there's a summary document. It doesn't contain all of it. But if you remember, in the early days, we supported collectively Suffolk public sector leaders supported Soda in its early days. 
that's now mainstream funded. You know, that that's proven its worth. We are now all contributing to it. Uh, and that includes the police, health and, and, and all local authorities. And I, I think we've seen it with uh, housing colleagues today. It's not just about the money. It's the capacity that we put into this. And we don't, you know, we don't put down the number of hours or the amount of officer uh, and indeed portfolio time that goes into this. But there is, a, you know, lots of additional capacity that goes into that. And I think there's an important sort of cultural point that the ability to seed some of these initiatives and put some money on the table really does permeate through the rest of the organizations and you know we get sort of a grand swell of, of commitment from from officers and other partners to uh, to actually do that you know the hard yards with the funding yeah ab absolutely and i think this this whole document is um testament to the power of county council and district councils and borough councils all working together the there's an exponential uh, effect when we all collaborate. We can all have our differences on, on individual items, but the actual power of us all working together far exceeds the total sum of our parts. And I'd, I'd really like to thank all of you for all your collaboration and work over the last um, couple of years. So the final item of business to come <coughs> with you today is in accordance with SPSL's terms of reference, the Chair's tenure lasts two years. So this will be my final <coughs> meeting as Chair of SPSL. Consequently, I'd like to nominate Councillor Hicks as the Chair for the next SPSL, and this to be ratified at the next meeting, next public meeting on the 23rd of June. I'd ask you all to raise a show of hands in agreement or or not, as the case may be. <laughs> David, yes. John, yes. Steve, yes. Tim, yes. John, yes. So, thank you all ever so much for all your participation and also to officers for all the support that you give us to make all of this happen. I'm really proud to have been chair of SBSL for the last couple of years. Really enjoyed it and thank you all for all your support. Tim. Well, I also would need to thank, thank you, Susan, for chairing it in such a, such a very fair, balanced and a dynamic manner. Because, no, seriously, it's not easy trying to bring a whole load of us together, least of all me. Um, but, no, that's, that's been very, very um, welcome. And uh, it does show, as everybody has said, working together, that is the way forward. None of this siloed mentality and all that uh, business, that just doesn't help. So that's really, really good. Um, and we've got a long, and I think a very worthy track record of doing it, and it has developed over the years. I think John and I, perhaps, you know, we're probably the original, original members of this uh, August group. Well, that's perhaps over egging a little bit, but now we can make a difference by working together, so that's really good. May I just bring up one other item, Susie, the, the report that Sorry. has been put together? I thought it was a very good document. Um, and I hope we can publicise uh, it to the wider community in Suffolk. I'm sure there will be people queuing up to read it. Uh, there is one clarification <coughs> I'd just like to make on the... David um, kindly mentioned our efforts together regarding gangs, youth violence and um, uh, county lines and the initiative that has been, is ongoing for some years. In the report, it talks about 150 arrests um, for the police for drugs. I just wanted to make it quite clear that relates to county lines. There are way more arrests than just 150 to drug-related offences um, during the year, but just in case that wasn't quite clear, um, um, I would hope people would realise there's a lot more being done than just those 150, which is really important, and that's county-wide. And great progress has been made there, and again, it shows the value of the joint working, not only arresting those uh, appalling people who apply this wicked and evil and sinister trade, but also the great work that's done by other agencies to try and prevent it in the first place. And we must never forget that. Prevention is always far better than cure, and that applies to all sorts of things, and that's why that focus, I think it's great that public sector leaders got right behind this initiative all those years ago, and it carries on, because the fight is not over yet, and we can't be complacent. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yes, Ian's indicated he will update that document. John? I'd just like to echo um, Tim's thanks on behalf of all of us to you, Susie in particular, and to officers for taking us through what has been an immensely successful and productive outcome, as outlined in that um, 
brief, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues and fellow leaders, because none of us know the election's coming, none of us know if we'll be here in post-May, um, except Matthew, of course, who is a very sensible choice, although he's not, he's not in his head. But nevertheless, therefore, thank you. Exactly, and, and Tim will definitely be here, but that one way or another, because he has youth on his side. Yes, exactly. Go, go. Yeah. But anyway, just actually thanks to you and the officers, and I think we should all be proud of what we've done. And it actually, it, it underlines what working together does do, as you, as you said. And you only have to look into other parts of the country or the world to show what happens when people don't work together. And I think Suffolk gives us a very good example of that. Thanks. As much as I into your leadership, but thank you. In which case, I declare the meeting closed, 11.34. Stop <coughs> Um, I would just ask, can you all stay, because I would like a photograph of us all together, a leaving photograph. Um, <laughs>